Okay. Stop sharing. Okay, there you go. Okay. I like your royal purple theme in the background. You noticed. <laughs> I, <yeah. laughs> and can, can, can you see that now? We can see it. Everybody can see it? Yes. Okay, then, uh, if you could, uh, now, Bob, do you want questions along the way or do you want to wait till the end or? Uh, yes, questions along the way are fine. Plus a special request to Mike Bach to please jump in and uh, correct me on any uh, mistakes I mis make about <clears throat> the British history or terminology or whatever. Uh, I apologize for the accent. It'll probably be a blend of uh, uh, Pennsylvania American as well as uh, maybe a few uh, British vowels thrown in now and again. So, okay, Bob. You got that, Mike? Okay, so if yeah. we could all turn, if we could all mute our, uh, our our windows, and then uh, if you have a question, turn it on and, and just shout. Sound good? Sounds okay, good. You're great. on, Bob. Yeah. Shall I take off? You ready? Okay. Uh, first of all, this truly is only an introduction, and uh, uh, there have been some. Uh, different pronunciations of M-A-C-H-I-N, but I think the one that is correct and, ex and most generally accepted is Machen. So uh, I, I know some people uh, come across that and they're not sure if they're, somebody's talking about his chin or something else, but in any case, Machen is the correct thing. Also, uh, my presentation does contain some copyrighted material and I've been in communications with the Royal Mail and uh, unlike the uh, uh, paper mail, my, I have had two to three exchanges with the Royal Mail a day uh, in related to issues for the presentation. Uh, just a general comment, they have given me the okay to use the copyrighted, copyrighted material in my live presentation but they don't want any of it to be posted on the internet. Uh, in other words, if we post a copy of the presentation on uh, the club website, uh, I'll have to remove all of the copyrighted material from that presentation and just put a, probably a slide in to indicate that the material has been removed. Uh, I do not collect British stamps. As much as it may look otherwise, I have an accumulation of British stamps. Uh, one thing that has happened during my uh, uh, preparation for this presentation is my wife, Kathy, uh, whose brother is part of the audience, by the way, uh, helped me with uh, the last slide. Uh, no more about the last slide for now. But in doing that, she has redeveloped her interest in stamps. She was a stamp collector until she was age 14, and then she really discovered boys and then really hasn't been interested in stamps since then. But she really did enjoy putting together this last slide. And uh, she now thinks that she may become a Machen collector. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I learned a lot uh, in putting together this presentation and in revisiting stamps, some of which I've not had, uh, I've not seen for over 40 years. Uh, so it's really reinvigorated uh, my own interest. So I think this will be a team project between my wife and me. So uh, to begin the show. Okay. Here is the first Machen. It was issued in 1967, and it was the four penny, which was the... Uh, I believe the postal rate at that time for first class mail. Uh, up here in the corner, you'll notice I have uh, Victoria and Elizabeth the second uh, overlapped. And you may be wondering why. Uh, I'm not gonna answer the question now, but I'll uh, fill you in later uh, about why that I believe is an appropriate uh, symbol for this presentation. Here are just as some, some samples. So when we talk about machins, these are machins. Stamps that have the uh, representation of the queen, 
uh, in this form and in this format. And uh, as you can see, uh, they come in different sizes, different shapes, different uh, colors. The top line here are the old pre-decimal uh, machins. Uh, this was, as you can see, instead of, it has a D here, one D, and down here it says one P. Uh, this is an old penny. There used to be 12 pennies in a shilling. Uh, whereas with the new uh, currency, the decimalized currency, there were uh, five pennies, new pennies or uh, new pence uh, in a shilling. Here is the one shilling stamp from the pre-decimal. And as you can see, the 5P stamp, and P is the common term for pence in Britain, uh, the 5P stamp uh, is the same color. Here, the one pound, the, the pound did not change. However, they did come up with a redesign of the pound sign, uh, as you can see uh, from the pre-decimal. And this came out not, uh, not long after they went to the decimalized uh, issues. So why are these events of any importance? Well, I believe, and I have not seen anything to contradict this, but if anybody knows otherwise, I'd sure like to know it, but I believe this is the longest continually issued design in postal history. Since 1967 till now, that's 53 years and counting. Uh, these will carry on as long as the queen is living and reigning. She is now 94 years of age. Uh, and uh, to put this in perspective, the oldest woman in Britain died this past week at age 112. So if the queen is now 94, there may be still, could be another 18 years of her reign ahead of us. Her. There are over 2,575 varieties. And when I say varieties, that may be the same stamp with just a different color. It's the same value stamp with a different color, different size, and other subtleties, which we'll get into later. But that is a huge number of varieties. I think that is uh, far, far more than, say, what the uh, issue, the, the American issue that I, I think was uh, has the most, and that was the uh, uh, Franklin uh, Washington issue from the early 1900s. Uh, I don't think it has 25 over 2,500 varieties. There are just with the, uh, uh, the stamps with denominations on them. There are over 148 different denominations listed on a stamp. 21 come from the old LSD. And that LSD, somebody pointed out to me, that does not stand for all people where you see that don't always think of pounds, shillings, and pennies, pence. Uh, the D there, as you saw on the first stamp, uh, was the symbol used for the old penny. Uh, I think that has another, another meaning, and it was pointed out to, again to me by my wife, Kathy, that uh, this past week, uh, some people celebrated the uh, 100th anniversary of the birth of Timothy Leary, who was also famously associated with another form of LSD. So in any case, uh, so after decimalization, there have been 127 more for, uh, different denominations on stamps. And this doesn't even include the non-denominated stamps, the equivalent of our forever stamps. Uh, early, about 12 years ago, they celebrated the uh, anniversary. There were some anniversaries being celebrated. At that time, they estimated that there have been 200 billion Machen stamps that have been issued and sold. And uh, that is a huge number. I think that's uh, probably around 12 or 13 for every person living in the world. And they believed, as I mentioned before, this to be the most for any single issue on a stamp. Uh, I don't know about that, but that, that's the claim. Besides, I just love these things. I think they're beautiful with a lot of people who like subtleties and tiny variations in, in exploring stamps. This is really the place to go. So who is this guy, Machen? Arnold Machen uh, was born 1911, 
Uh, Stoke and Trent in Staffordshire, that's probably about 65 miles northwest of Birmingham. Birmingham. For those of you who uh, know anything about uh, uh, Britain, uh, it's probably about a two and a half to three hour drive from London up to Stoke on Trent. Uh, it's famous for uh, its pottery works there. And that's where Min, uh, Machen started uh, working at age 14 as an apprentice in the Minton pottery, which is actually one of the famous potteries. If you uh, uh, ever watch the Antiques Roadshow uh, or know anything about pottery, Minton is a famous name in pottery. And then he went to school in uh, at the Derby. Uh, that is the correct pronunciation of D-E-R-B-Y, by the way, in Britain. Uh, it's not Derby, it is Derby. And the famous race is also the Derby, not the Derby. So uh, if you were to ask somebody in Britain, uh, how, where do I place my bet on the uh, Derby? Uh, they would not know what you're talking about. So anyhow, very interestingly, uh, Arnold Machen was a conscientious objector and he was in prison uh, during World War II for a year uh, at uh, Wormwood Scrubs. Uh, which is a famous, one of the famous prisons in Britain. It's in West London. And it's uh, been, it's been shown, the, the front gates of Wormwood Scrubs are, have appeared in a lot of British movies. If they have prisons and you see a prison gate, it's very likely ha to have been uh, the prison gates for Wormwood Scrubs. Uh, Machen didn't start out to design something for stamps. He was actually approached and uh, won the uh, uh, award to uh, produce the design of the queen for uh, the early, the first decimal coins. So it actually, this all started with him being involved in the production of the queen's head for coinage rather than for stamps. And he said before he was asked to design the new definitive issue, I had not been, he said, I had not been very interested in stamps, but now I begin to look at them more critically. And for me, when I went back and started this, this uh, presentation and started working with my matrons again, I also began to really appreciate them a lot more than I had before. So matrons design. It actually began, uh, his thinking began with the famous Penny Black. And that was came from a medal that was designed by uh, a man by the name of William Wyan. Uh, so that's why you see uh, Queen Victoria up here and uh, why this is a, uh, oops, excuse me. Okay why uh, I'm using this as a symbol. It really does go back and we'll see more about that just very shortly. He began his design in 1965. And uh, as I said, it was for the coinage. And they were th these designs were based on photographs by Princess Margaret's husband, Lord Snowden. Uh, in 65, he was then one of five artists chosen to submit designs for the new definitive stamps. So he'd already been approved and working on the design of the coinage. And now he, he along with four others, were asked to uh, produce designs for the uh, new decimal stamps, uh, new set of definitive stamps. They were, the first ones were uh, pre-decimal. The early, in the early designs, you'll see that the queen was wearing a tiara. Uh, however, uh, he got input from the Stamp Advisory Committee, and they preferred the queen with a diadem, which is a crown, rather than a tiara. And the diadem, or the crown, that you'll see up here, is actually the same crown that Queen Victoria wore on the penny black. So again, there's this connection between Queen Victoria and Queen Elizabeth on these designs. Uh, he did, he, he, he uh, Machen was a sculptor and he based his designs, he sculpted the head of the queen on a, in a bas relief, uh, I'm sorry, a bas relief uh, format. Uh, and right now 
I don't know if you can see it. My, my cover, mine is covered, but this is a photograph of Arnold Machen uh, working on his uh, bas relief uh, sculpture. Can you is that? Can you see that on your screens, or is it covered on yours as well? You can see it. Okay. Uh, one thing you should know is that the Queen has to approve any stamp that her, has her image on it. I don't believe it requires her approval if it's just her silhouette, which is typical on most of the non-definitive non stamps where you just see a silhouette of the queen on the stamps, but where it has her image, the features of her face or a, uh, her, in, a photograph of her, uh, some, some stamps do have photographs of the queen and other members of the royal family. Anything with the queen's image on it, she must need, she has to approve it personally. And as we look at the next ones, we'll, you'll see that uh, uh, there had been some design changes along the way. Uh, another quote from uh, Arnold Machen. I think it is generally accepted, at least by connoisseurs, that the penny black is probably the finest stamp ever designed. And I decided to create the same kind of effect. That is a light image, Again, the light image on a dark background. So as his thinking and development of the design evolved, uh, that became to be a critical part of the design. So this is one of the things that uh, I drew on that I, I, I had to contact the uh, uh, Royal Mail. The copyrights on the photos actually are held by about, uh, I don't know, I think it was about seven or eight different authorities. And trying to get the approvals from all of them just was an impossible task. But uh, the Royal Mail felt that it would be okay for me to show this uh, with just uh, the, the caveat that it not be included and posted on the uh, internet. This actually comes from an insert in one of the uh, Royal Mail postal packets uh, for the Machins. So here's the evolution. Machin started with the uh, uh, Penny Black. Then he added the Queen's head. And as you, as you can see, all this filigree and wording still followed along. Here, it became a little bit sharper. The Queen's image is sharper and against the background. These are just evolutions in the design, again, going through the various types. But here you can see the filigree starts to stop, drop away, but we do retain wording. Then it just became postage. Then finally out here, you see that uh, the, uh, all the verbiage has gone and only the value is retained. And that's actually how the stamps look today. Just the image with the value and no verbiage. And finally, uh, from this photograph, you see the diadem, the crown. Then in the next uh, further development, it's the crown being used. The queen was presented this, I think, for approval, and she rejected it. Uh, she did not, she did not like just to have a bust of her on it. She wanted a corsage to be added. Now, I, that's really when I read that she wanted a corsage, I thought that she wanted some flowers to be added. And however, when I looked it up, a corsage actually, the first definition for it is for a bodice or uh, the upper part of the dress. So Machen added up, up here, as you can see, the bodice on the uh, uh, design. And that became the, uh, uh, the basis for that, that became the design of the First Nations. Uh, this is just showing one with, uh, this is like our forever stamp. It's a first class stamp rather than uh, a denominated stamp. So again, Arnold Nation, when I first began to design for the stamp, I tended to use rather elaborate frames surrounding the poach portrait, but gradually by eliminating and eliminating, reach very much simpler statements. Now, when you think about it, at least for me, when I think of artists, I think of them doing embellishments. In this case, 
uh, Nation went the opposite direction, and he went from a rather fancy, uh, a lot of content design to one that was very simple, but outstandingly beautiful. Okay, uh, I've introduced you to Arnold Machen. You've seen what the stamps look like. Now, some into, into more philatelic areas. The packaging, and I don't know if packaging is the right word uh, here, but it's the one I'll use. And it's for just the various forms uh, that the uh, stamps were sold in. Colors, printing methods, printers, phosphor, security, different types of uh, ways that uh, matrons have been used. And finally, the country, country issues uh, or regional issues. And if you don't know what that means, don't worry about it, we'll get to it. Okay, packaging individual stamps, strips, blocks, gutter pairs, blocks. Uh, I can't see what's over to the side here. I guess that says singles, I'm not sure. Anyhow, miniature sheets, booklets, ordinary, uh, there are two types of booklets just the ordinary ones and something that are called prestige booklets. And uh, the US actually has produced a, a few prestige booklets. I'll, I'll mention these later. And presentation packs. These are the things produced by the Royal Mail, uh, which have a lot of information about whatever issue is in that pack and uh, are sold by uh, the Philatelic Bureau and by uh, some of the larger post offices in Britain, not every post office, the little village post office probably doesn't have presentation packs. Uh, the main post office in the cities uh, probably do. And then finally, boxes. Boxes. What are boxes have to do with stamps? And you'll find out. And to me, it's the most intriguing part of packaging of stamps that I've ever seen. Okay. So the simple ones are just individual uh uh, stamps. Uh, here you can see, here's an example of one denomination, the 10P. And here are just one, two different sizes and three different colors. Here, the pound uh, uh, stamp, uh, two different sizes. And then here's first class and first class large. And these, the first class is for like a normal letter. This is for the same weight limit, 100 grams, but it's uh, uh, for a larger size uh, envelope. Uh, so they have two different stamps, cost different uh, price. There are different prices for each of those. Some other varieties, and these I actually didn't even know I had, uh, came across them while going through some things. Uh, and I could not find this one in listed in Scots, uh, and that's probably because of the way Scots has their stamps organized for the Machins. But this is the E here, stands for Europe. This is for a, like a uh, forever stamp for a normal letter going from Britain to Europe. This is for, there was an equivalent, there's an equivalent one for worldwide. Uh, I don't have one. Here is for a postcard. This one is for worldwide. And what I don't have, there are also some two, two stamps that were issued for special delivery. Again, non-denominated, but for uh, use on special delivery and the forever type uh, equivalent. Strips of stamps. These were sold in vending machines and uh, the we had these at our local post office when I was living in Britain. Uh, by the way, I lived there twice, once from 1974 to 1984, and again in uh, 1998 uh, and 99 for about uh, eight months. Uh, it had to do with my work. I was working for uh, a computer manufacturer, and uh, my first assignment starting in 1974 was for two years but being the slow work, worker that I am, it took me 10 years to actually uh, finish up the assignment. Actually, they moved the headquarters and me along with it to get me back to the States. Otherwise, I'd still be there. Anyhow, these strips of stamps were sold in vending machines. Uh, interestingly, these were uh, purely mechanical. 
Uh, in this case, you put a, a 5P, a 5 pence coin into the slot, pull the little lever, and the five stamps would come out. These were built into the walls. These vending machines were built into the walls of our local post office on the exterior walls. So you could buy these stamps any time of the day, week, you know, any day of the week, uh, and so on. And these are the uh, format they, that they came in. The earlier ones came in four, a strip of five stamps, and then they went to four. Finding these in Scots is a little bit, I guess to me, was a little bit illogical. Rather than starting with the lowest price, these are listed under the higher value stamp. So if you look for under the 2P uh, for the nation, you will then find uh, this listed for with the a strip of these and the ditto for these here, they would be under the 4P stamp. Okay, Machen locks, uh, block of four, just the same as we all think of a block of four, uh, a, a typical, and this is just another block of four except for the larger size stamp. Notice the, again, the same, this is the same denomination, a 50P stamp and a 50P stamp. Uh, the larger ones were the earlier ones, the smaller ones uh, were the uh, later ones. I don't know if that reflects the shrinking value of the pound. Uh, while, when I arrived in Britain in 1974, uh, the pound was worth $2 and I converted to $2.40. When I left in 1984, uh, the pound was at $1.30, which is close to what it is right, uh, right around now. The other types, which uh, most I think most people are familiar with gutter blocks. These are gutter blocks or gutter pairs. This one is uh, uh, typical of a lot of British stamps. Uh, I think starting in the 1970s, these became available. These gutter pairs, which what they call uh, traffic uh, signal gutter pairs, they have these are the dots for the colors that are used in that stamp. Uh, for stamps, uh, some of the uh, larger, I'll call commemorative stamps. These were uh, you could sometimes have four or five. Uh, I don't know if maybe even more dots for the different colors that were used in the production of the stamp. These were, when these became available, these came, were very, very popular and were uh, uh, really sought after by collectors, these gutter pairs with the traffic lights. Uh, I only have a few of them, uh, and this is by far the uh, highest value one. This one I was fortunate to get. And I, I, I got that just by ordering it from the Royal uh, Mail, at asking them, for a traffic light gutter pair, and they sent me one. Uh, I'd say nine times out of 10, or maybe it was 24 out of 25 times when you asked for a traffic signal uh, gutter pair, you wouldn't get it. So I lucked out on that one. Okay, miniature sheets. Uh, as you can see, here are, and let me uh, zoom in a bit so you can see this a bit better. These miniature sheets, uh, very nice uh, satinant, satinant uh, uh, pairs on these. Uh, this was issued for the uh, two, year 2000 stamp show. And uh, here's another one. These, interestingly, uh, these are Machens. No question about it. This is a the... Uh, uh, Machen head on uh, Queen Elizabeth. Uh, and, but for some reason, these stamps are listed in the regular portion of the uh, Scots catalog, uh, along with this stamp, which is the same as an earlier uh, British stamp, but I believe the earlier one was one shilling, one and a half shillings, if I remember correctly. In any case, this is a, was a pound uh, stamp. These all are, are definitely, you know, just usable on post. And I think if you found these on uh, this one in particular, on any kind of mailing uh, contemporary just with its uh, issue date, I think it might be, of, 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 you know, uh, some value. These, interestingly, now these, you, you know, are listed in the general portion, 
These are listed in Scots in the Machin portion. And these are all Machins. Uh, again, this was uh, to commemorate the queen and uh, uh, for one of her birthdays. And uh, uh, you'd have to tear away, away the, uh, 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 the miniature, to tear these out of the miniature sheet to use them. And again, I think these on, like, on correspondence would be on covers. Uh, would be a nice addition to any collection. Okay, going now into the booklets. Here is an, another example of the LSD or pre, pre decimal booklet. Uh, some things I'd like you to note on here. Uh, this is, these were stitched. This was typical of British booklets for a very long period of time. They were stitched together. And I don't know if these were hand stitched, because these look, I'm not a, a person you, sitting at a machine doing these one at a time or how these were stitched, I really don't know. But I mean, the stitching isn't, you know, perfectly straight. There's little bit of wobbles in there. It does suggest that maybe these were done by a person sitting in a machine uh, and hand putting them through the machine. Another interesting aspect of this is the uh, advertising that was uh, in the uh, booklets. This was for the Rapid Results College in London, England. I actually looked this up today. The Rapid Results College, I think, was founded in 1924 as still in operation. So if you're interested, they're advertising. Uh, they will help you to improve your career. For those of you who want to restart a career or improve your current one, the Rapid, the rapid uh, Results College has been endorsed by the Royal Mail. Again, now the evolution of booklets. The earliest versions, this we're into the decimal ones now. They still have the stitching on them. You can see this at the top here and on the side here. But then as uh, we moved later on, this was probably in the early 70s, we're probably getting into the mid 70s, late 70s now. They moved, transitioned to stamps and no longer were using stitching. By the way, these this little uh, bit of uh, weight below here, these were mount, I, to, to scan these, I had to put these into mounts. And on the thicker items, the mounts produced this type of uh, uh, reflection uh, when they were scanned. That It's nothing to do with the stamps or the mount. It's just the way the light hit that uh, portion of the mylar. Uh, covering on the uh, mount. And then they even progressed to a larger size. Then after they then started using themes on uh, some of the covers. And I, I, I really like this one. Uh, this was made of different farmhouses from different portions of Britain. I'll show that you more of it. But if you opened up the booklet, this drawing and what looks like it's just a drawing in the front actually goes all the way around and the back and actually covers about you know eighty percent of the uh, of the booklet. It's very it's a very nice design, I, I think. Uh, they use different artists, different themes, and uh, the booklets down here. If I can get, I can show you if I can down in here. You can see this is in Scotland, and it identifies uh, which booklet is in the series and how many are in the series. And here is that uh, complete uh, series for that, uh, all of the booklets for that particular series. Uh, these were the, the, the artwork done, was done by an artist by the name of Norman Batterhill, and he went all over Britain. The first ones, this first one, I, I is one that I really do like. I'll uh, zoom in on that. And I don't know how many people are familiar with Oast houses. Uh, you in uh, you can see these in uh, where I've seen them the most is in County Kent, which is in the uh, southeast corner of uh, Britain. You would drive. If you were driving from London to the Dover uh, port, 
you would drive through Kent. Canterbury is in Kent, uh, the famous Canterbury Cathedral. But these oast houses are actually kilns used for drying of hops, tobacco, and um, uh, malt. So the very, very important to the brewing industry of which Britain does have a small interest in good brews. So I, I skipped, but that's okay. I can just go. I just wanted Keep to point out then these others were uh, different buildings in different parts of the country. A Northern Ireland farmhouse, Yorkshire, Wales, Scotland, Scotland and Sussex. Hey, Bob, do, yeah. you, do you actually have those? Yes. Oh, okay. Because I've, I've got a few remnants from my father. <laughs> so. Okay. No, I, th these I have, and these are all complete. Okay. These they, are, they are not all complete. The stamps in them. Yeah. Thank you, though. Okay. This is a sort of... A, a, a quite an unusual book in a couple of ways. Uh, I'll just the first part, the cover. Can anyone spot here the unusual feature about this cover? And I'm not talking about the dancing horse. I mean, that's fairly unusual. Or the oriental lady with thigh high boots. But there's something I've never, there's something on this cover that I've never seen on an American cover or booklet or Stamps being sold this way ever. Is it the United discount? States. Sorry? Is it the discount? Yes. Yes. 12 and a half pence, tw 20 of those would be two pounds 50. That's 30% off. I, I'm sorry, that's 30 pence, 30 pence off. Yeah, 30 pence off, which would be uh, probably around 12% discount. Uh, stamps sold by the post office at a discount. I, I think that's unheard of in this country. The other interesting aspect about this booklet is that when you open it up, now I've, this is a, nor, a natural fold here. These stamps are folded over, but the backs of these stamps have stars printed on them. Uh, there are only about, I think, three or four uh, issues that I could find that have stars printed on the back. Uh, and and a, very, a, a really unusual feature. And again, something a little bit different that in the Machins. As we move on, these are some examples of uh, more recent booklets. As you can see, now they're non-denominated. They're first class, second class. These are uh, later versions of the same thing, uh, first class and second class. Here you see the large. The large. Did, this is a, a more recent introduction, having a uh, uh, a, a forever type stamp for a larger um, mailing. The other ones were for standard size envelopes uh, uh, and they have just first and second class. And Britain still does have first and second class mail. Uh, I don't know with the recent mailings to Lidditz from here, I don't know what to call our recent, the class of our recent mails. <laughs> It's, I think it's two pounds 42 cents for a letter, for a card. For these days? Two pounds 42 pence. For I the? Think, for a regular uh, letter. The first class letter in Britain? Oh no, this is to, from a, um, International, sorry. Oh, international, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that probably, that sounds about right, which is a lot, lot more than our $1.15. Uh, our postal rates, uh, compared with other uh, major nations in the world, are extremely low. Uh, believe it or not, they are. This is interesting uh, because if you look at this, these two booklets, they look exactly the same, on, don't they? However, when you open them up and look at these, well, the two things. First, I think you can notice immediately, these have normal perforations and these have what 
uh, in Britain are called elliptical perforations, and which Scott describes as syncopated perforations. Uh, same thing, uh, different words. Uh, uh, that's not, there are many such examples of, of this between British English and American English. Uh, uh, when, our, our, when our children, when we were moving back from England to the United States, uh, we had to ask, uh, tell our children, do not, do not, under any circumstances, ask any of your classmates for a rubber. Uh, a rubber in Britain is a pencil eraser. It's a term used every day uh, in schools at that time. Pencils may be less now, but at that time. So we had to really instruct them. Also, we had a good friend of ours, uh, who, an English friend, came over to the United States, and she went to the butcher shop uh, one day uh, to get meat for the sun, Sunday meal. And she came up to the counter. There was an 18-year-old, 18, 20-year-old 18, chap behind the counter. And she asked him for, uh, could I have a, I'd like to get a joint, please. He looked at her. He paused. And he said, madam, we, or I don't think she said madam. She said, I don't think we, we don't sell those. We don't sell joints here. She looked at him and looked down into the display case, could see the joint which is in Britain is a piece of meat uh, and uh, on the bone and uh, saw it right and, he, and looked at him and said, it's right there. And uh, she was so flustered when she got out. Uh, she got in her car with her daughter, fortunately, came out of the shopping area, stopped at a traffic light and her daughter said, mom, you're driving on the wrong side of the road. Uh, she had just been so flustered by the experience with, at the butcher shop that she had gotten out and driven on the left-hand side of the road. Uh, something I've done as well. <laughs> uh, Bob, anyhow, yeah. We had a, uh, an English exchange student with us for a while when our colleges were exchanging students. And uh, like the first night, you know, she was going to go into work with me. And next, that first night, she said, uh, would you knock me up tomorrow morning? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yes, that's... Uh, in fact, you, you can, when you, if you're staying in a hotel, you can tell them what time you would like them to knock you up in the morning. So, uh, if for those of you, that just means to awaken you, give you a wake up call. So who was it who said that, uh, talking about how close American and Britain are and almost everything, but the language. <laughs> yes, that's, yeah. there's a lot to that. Two countries separated by a common language. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Prestige booklets. Uh, this is just a very brief introduction to these. Uh, by the way, I don't know if you've noticed, all of the, uh, the Machen stamps typically have a prefix of MH before them. That's a Scott listing. MH, I'll get into that, explain a bit more about that later and how to find them. Uh, but the booklets, uh, Interestingly, Scott's does a fairly good job of listing all of the British booklets uh, that have been issued. Uh, for the thematic ones that I showed earlier ones, they'll, they identify the theme, but they don't list uh, the individual, uh, the number of uh, uh, different covers in a theme or uh, how many there were. Uh, they just list that there would be a theme of farmhouses uh, or theme of railway uh, engines, something like that. Uh, but they do list them and they have a BK. Now, I thought this was done in my honor, Bob Katanchik, but uh, honest, I, I, my cat, again, my wife Kathy puts me in my place and she had Bob now really, that really does, I think, stand for booklets. So, anyhow, these are really lovely. Uh, they're, uh, these are two which, which did have Masons in them. Uh, and uh, Let's see, the first one was for uh, the wedge wood, which interestingly was one of the potteries where Arnold Machen did work at one time. And as he, as potters became more senior, they would have a mark or initials on works that they produced. 
And there are uh, Machen works of pottery uh, from Wedgwood, and I think perhaps one maybe other uh, potter, uh, pottery. But in any case, those Machen works of pottery are now highly collectible and can be very expensive. So he, he made his name in two different areas, which uh, is really quite a, 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 mar a remarkable accomplishment. So these are just examples of the booklets. I think I, okay. Uh, the earlier ones contained a lot of mach uh, contained many machins, and they, they, uh, a, a lot of with uh, satinant uh, varieties to them. Uh, so they would be you those satinant varieties would be unique to that uh, particular booklet, which then make those um, harder to find and uh, more expensive to collect. Uh, the later uh, prestige booklets then uh, were for commemorative stamps. Like they've had James Bond ones. They've had, uh, oh, kind of a whole range of them, uh, uh, pop singers and so on. And up till uh, February 2019, which is as far as my catalog, my Scott catalog went, uh, uh, there, were 20, there were 80 of these prestige booklets uh, issued. In 2007, to commemorate the 40th anniversary of the first Machen, there was BK-182 was issued commemorating that Machen. I'll get to that in a second. And then I, I think I'd mentioned that the U.S. had issued quite a few prestige type booklets. Uh, and the ones that I'm aware of and, and have are the U.S. Navy submarines, the Lewis and Clark, and Old Glory. So I, I, if you haven't seen those, you can, if you want to see what a prestige booklet and have those in your collection, take a look at them. The, the British ones are very similar in size and, and uh, design in the way they present the stamps and have very, some, some interesting uh, uh, insights and history about the topic they're on. Here is the Mason prestige booklet. Again, I don't know how well this can come, can, you can see this, but this is the Machen design of the queen. And on this booklet, the cover is actually embossed uh, so that you have the uh, bas relief of the uh, sculptor, just the way Machen would have uh, seen it uh, or produced it. And here is Arnold Machen, looking at the first uh, run of stamps coming off the press back in 1967. Uh, this, the, the booklet contains these stamps, these stamps that's a block of four. Again, I, I don't see, maybe I can get, I don't know if there's a way I can get rid of this on my screen. There we go. Okay. Uh, as you can see, uh, has stamps with Machen, and uh, the Queen, and these are uh, uh, not listed under Machen varieties, even though these are very clearly, these two stamps are clearly Machens, and this is actually Mr. Machen himself. These are listed in the regular portion of the, uh, of the catalog. Okay, another way that these things are sold are through uh, presentation packets. These are the things that pr are produced by the Royal Mail. And as I mentioned before, you can order them through the uh, philatelic services based in, which is in Edinburgh, uh, Scotland. Uh, I bought one, the bottom set this year, this was issued March 17th. I bought this when I was uh, asked to do this presentation. I, I uh, went ahead and ordered uh, the latest set of machins that I could get to make to have some more recent varieties in my collection. This is one I had bought, I think, probably in a, on a visit to Britain uh, in 2013. But as you can see, uh, there. This is a, just a presentation. That th these are overlapping on this slide. The uh, inserts. This the insert on these are actually the same, and that's where I found. Uh, the evolution of the heads in the Machen design. So they have, they can contain some very interesting information. 
you can order these online. Uh, if you just look for, go on and to the internet and, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, ask, uh, type in looking for the Royal Mail, you can easily find their website. And uh, the shipping costs aren't that bad. And mine was delivered within a couple of weeks uh, from the time I ordered to the time it was delivered. And that was uh, during the COVID-19 uh, periods where things have slowed down. This is my, my favorite one. I bought these again at a dispenser built into the uh, wall of our local post office, the exterior wall. These are just books of stamps. They're about, I'd say, three sixteenths of the, in uh, boxes of stamps. These are about three sixteenths from uh, of an inch from top to bottom. Uh, they're folded over, and they have just loose individual stamps inside. The, to produce these things, I believe would have required some degree of you know of manual labor to uh tear the stamps and then put them in the boxes fold the boxes and seal them uh i have three of these that uh i i bought probably uh in uh 19, period sometime around 1975 to 1977 in uh when we were living in amersham in buckinghamshire so I, I, I just, I, if anybody has seen boxes of stamps sold like this any place else in the world, like through, and especially through a, uh, some sort of dispensing machine, I, I'd be interested because I've never seen anything like these any place else. Uh, uh, catalog listed? I'm sorry? Are these listed in any catalog? No, the stamps are listed, but not the, uh, uh, not the packaging. So no, I, I, let's put it this way. They are not listed in Scots. Uh, I'll get into uh, Stanley uh, Gibbons catalogs uh, and uh, finding these in there, uh, I, I need to do that. But uh, when you see what the Stanley Gibbons catalogs are like, I will, uh, you will see the challenge ahead of me in trying to find them. But, uh, I, as of now, I've not found them, found any listing. If I do, I will come back and let people know. So, so moving on. What? Sorry. Bob, what so, year are those? Well, I bought them around 75 to 77. Okay, thank you. Okay. Colors. Uh, this is just a small, very small sampling of the colors. These are just the colors that they use on the uh, stamps from the one half penny, the, the hay penny, up to the 19 and a half pence stamps. Uh, as you can see, there are multiple colors for the same value stamp. For example, the 17 piece, uh, the seven piece stamp has four different colors to them. And likewise, the 17 P stamp has four colors to them. Uh, I extracted this from a website. Uh, they have the colors for all of the uh, Machen issues showing uh, the color and the variety. And that website is really uh, outstanding. And I'll, I'll give a reference to it later in, in the presentation at the end. Uh, but uh, this just gives you some idea of the myriad of colors that exist for nations. Okay, printing methods, I'm not gonna go into them. And this was a challenge. Uh, when I looked for at a, a several different sources to see the types of printing methods that have been used on uh, for Machen stamps. And what was annoying was that uh, when I went from site to site, the lists did not all we're not all we're not the same uh there'd be a, a a new one on one site and one omitted on another site or on the same site and so on uh these are ones that i i think are are, are probably correct i can't guarantee them uh but anyhow 
uh, this just to, to show you the different types of printing methods that have been used uh, to produce the machins. And when you move from printer to printer, from one printer to another printer, minor differences do appear in the designs and they can be detected and they are noted. Some of them are noted in Scots, so they don't identify who the printers are, but uh, Stanley Gibbons does uh, go into that level of detail, showing you the differences and uh, who did the printings. Who are the various printers? I'm sorry, this is, uh, uh, this is the, uh, the these I, I, I'm confident with. All of these people have produced uh, uh, stamps. It's the methods of printing that I'm not sure I, uh, of the total accuracy of, of the list. But Harrison and Sons, they were the original ones. And they've been involved for quite a long time. And I think off and on. The House of Quest, the Waddington, and Shetty. That's a uh, printing firm uh, located in uh, the Netherlands. And their stamps, uh, the first and sheds that I am aware of were the 8P, which were a crimson or bright red color. And those are, the color on those are, and the, the uh, clarity of the design are just absolutely outstanding. Beautiful, beautiful work. I, 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 I I, I regret that I didn't include just a, a comparison of uh, one of the other printers and the Enchete because it, it really is, the colors are the same, but the clarity and uh, the pureness of the colors are, 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 are remarkable. Harcher and then international security printers. That's one of the more recent ones and has to do with some of the leading, uh, later security methods that have been used to reduce forgeries and also to, uh, reduce the peeling off of unpostmarked un stamps uh, from, from uh, covers to be reused on other covers. So here's an example of a printer difference. And I, I don't know the printers. I, I extracted this from uh, Scott's, but I don't know which printer is which. These are uh, two blocks, uh, two and a half piece stamps I've, I've, by different printers. They're listed. And if you go in Scott, you find them under MH, uh, 32 and 33. The difference is right here. If you go from the two in the to the bottom of the two here, where it comes down uh, into the base, there is this one is very very slightly thinner than uh, the downstroke as it gets close to the base. I don't know if you can see that. I'll try to go in a little bit closer. Can you see the difference? People are muted or you don't see the difference. Under higher magnification, uh, I, I, I assure you that you can see the difference. Hmm. Okay, phosphorus, this is a Patients don't have watermarks, but they have phosphors. And the phosphors are where you find, uh, contribute to the uh, complexity and number of varieties of different nations, because there's a whole, there's a, a number of different phosphors uh, that uh, ways of apply, applying the phosphors uh, that uh, uh, create distinctive uh, varieties. Scott does not list any of the phosphors. I think they note that they're on the stamps, but they don't go into any detail. You have to go to Stanley Gibbons uh, to get that level of information. And uh, it's found on, they're found on many of the uh, nations, but not all of them. There are different types of phosphor. Uh, some stamps, no phosphor, a single band, a double band, and then phosphor coated paper. The ones that are supposed to have phosphor and don't, in other words, there's, there's, they've, for some reason, the phosphor wasn't applied. These are rarities. And some of, I've seen uh, in one, for one example, I think 30,000 pounds in Stanley Gibbons for the catalog value of one of those. 
Uh, so it, getting a complete collection with all of the varieties can be extremely uh, expensive. Getting a an extensive collection, but ignoring the highly expensive rarities is, you know, um, manageable if you have the time and uh, uh, are willing to do it over a period of time. Uh, the phosphorus typically are really, the single band, double bands are really, uh, I, I, you can see them in, in normal daylight. Uh, sometimes you can just look at it straight at, and looking at the stamp and other times you have to tilt it a bit to see it. Here's an example. This is done under normal light. I don't know if you can see it. On the stamp here on the left, do you see here, the line here and the line here? On this one, if you notice the line is, there's these two lines that are close to the center of the stamp. And where this is on the selvage up here at the top, you can see it more clearly, this little bit of darkened area. In any case, those are the phosphor bands. Here are these same two stamps under UV light. Here you can easily see the two bands of phosphor, one on each side of the stamp. Here you can see the phosphor band coming down the center of the stamp. So uh, why, uh, yes. Why do these have the same catalog number? You would think they were two different varieties. They not in, in Scott. Scott does not list phosphor varieties. They would these would be under Stanley in Sandy Gibbons catalog. Uh, uh, Scott totally ignores the phosphor varieties. That's why they have the same catalog Scott catalog number. Okay. If I may interject, uh, a complete source of all those Machen designs is the Degum Handbook. And this is, lists everyone, lists all the uh, varieties, has pictures of all the different uh, overprints, the, uh, the, the markings, everything you're talking about. It is total, totally complete for the Machens. And still available. Yeah, that, that's wonderful. And that's what's great about doing something like this. Uh, being able to learn something new uh, when uh, in, in, in giving a presentation like that. It, uh, none of us know everything about uh, any, uh, any one topic that is as complex as this. I, I appreciate that. Many thanks. I uh, will. I will put that up in the shared screen eventually. Okay, thank you. Hey, Bob. Yeah. yeah. In in a Stanley Gibbons um, Great Britain Concise, those three and a half P have two different catalog listings. Yeah, as I say, Stanley Gibbons would have them all. Yeah. yeah. Three and a half P, I'm, I'm curious. I'm gonna look it up. Go ahead. X858 and 859. Okay, here are <coughs> the perforation varieties. It's it's not uh, in different. Uh, uh, there, there there can be some different uh, perforations, but uh, here I'm just going to uh, indicate something new. This was done for security purposes, and this is written up uh, in the Royal Mail uh, to be. The earlier one, standard perforations, and I pointed out earlier the elliptical perforations. Uh, they're, they're, it, it adds one more degree of complexity to the forger to add that. But what I think the main purpose is, according to the Royal Mail, was to make the removal of unpostmarked stamps more difficult. I really wonder if having that difference in the perforation makes it that more difficult. I, I, I haven't tried it, but I, I'm, there's, I have a degree of skepticism about that. Anyhow, this, the uh, elliptical perforations were introduced in, in uh, 1993, and they're now standard on all of the UK definitive issues, but not the commemorative issues. And again, as I mentioned before, uh, Scott does not use the term elliptical 
uh, they use the term syncopated. They mean the same thing. However, syncopated uh, is uh, somewhat different. Let me. The first syncopated stamps that I have found in Scots are from a Dutch issue in the Netherlands in, I think, 1923. But a totally different type of syncopation in those stamps, uh, they rather than them, they'd have a, a a solid portion followed by perforations, followed by a solid portion followed uh, by perforations, and so on. And uh, so there were no elliptical cuts in those. There was just spacing between perforations, and Scott calls those syncopated as well. And I don't, I, I, if anyone knows of any earlier syncopated perfs, uh, I, I'd be interested. Uh, I, I know on uh, some of the U.S. stamps, there was there were the perforation experiments uh, where there were sort of like notches cut into them. I forget what they're called right now. Uh, but anyhow, uh, if you if you if somebody knows of any something earlier than the Dutch 1921-23 issue for uh, those, uh, I think I have, I, I, I'd be interested to know the Scott numbers for those, I'm sorry, it was 1925, 1926, and the Dutch stamps were catalog numbers 142A to 162A. So I, 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 I one of my areas of interest and fascination are perforations, so I'd be interested to know. Okay. There we go. Security die cuts. Can you see this here? These are cut into the stamp. These are uh, I call them perforations because that's what a perforation does. They cut into a stamp. It doesn't have to be a hole. It can be a slit. That's what these are. These are now also standard on uh, British definitives. And they were uh, introduced in 2009. And these, I do really make it much more difficult to remove a stamp uh, that's not been postmarked and reuse it because when you try to peel this off, that uh, portion that is has the die cuts uh, isn't going to come off cleanly. That I've tried. So uh, uh, that was another security enhancement in the Machins. Bob, were those were those stamps uh, self adhesive? Yes. yes. Okay. Thanks. Made sense. Yeah. Most of it. Uh, I think all the definitives now are self are self adhesive. While as commemoratives, I think I'm pretty sure uh, still have uh, are, are gummed. Okay. Now on this one, here's the challenge for you. Do you see the difference in the backgrounds? Oops, that is not what I wanted to do. How do I get out of this now? I clicked on the wrong button and I don't know how to get out of this. Uh, the I, magnifying glass? Yeah, that's what I wanted, but this double, this double uh, slide is not what I wanted. And Now, this is really gone. Nope. Is there a full screen setting? Not that I see on what I see. Try again the magnifying glass. Double click on it or something like that. Now. Try that. Let me just uh, escape out of this for a second. 
Oh, go back to screen sharing. Do you see this now? Do you see the presentation again? Not yet. Uh, I'm clicking on now. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Just put on slideshow and you're ready yep. to go. Yep. Got back to where I wanted to be. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, I don't know. This is not easy to see, uh, I admit. But uh, do you see, does anyone see any difference between these backgrounds? I think here uh, they just, you can see some blotchiness probably on both of them. Is that probably fair? I can read Royal Mail. Sorry? I can read Royal Mail on the background of the red, red stamps. On the, on the red ones? Yeah that well spotted excellent eyesight i don't know if anybody else can see that i can see it okay oh yeah yep yeah. yeah okay okay good excellent what is that this is uh these have just a plain background solid ink uh solid uh ink, nothing on it. These uh, have iridescent, these are iridescent overprints that are put onto the stamp for security reasons. And if you, this is a blow up of the stamp, of a stamp, and you can see up, up here it's saying Royal Mail. However, if you look over here, I don't know if you see this. On this line, it says, uh, just a second. Okay, I've lost my laser pointer, but anyhow, you can see that it says uh, the AL from Royal and then M and then L, but instead it's M15L instead of Royal Mail. That is not an error. Over here on this side, you see AL coming down and the M for male, but then you see T I L. What is that all about? Oh, I can pick up my laser printer pointer again. Okay. These are codes. Uh, these are the codes that are listed as of 2019. That's the latest I have version I have. Uh, on the first one over here, if you see this, the M15L, that relates to, that's the date code where the NN, the letters between the, the T, the M and the L, I'm sorry, the numbers between the M and the L, the 15, indicate that that is the year, uh, the date year for that uh, issue. What is date year? I'm not sure. Uh, it's listed in Scott as date year. Is that the date of issue or is that the date of printing? Uh, I think it could be the date of printing since these are overprints. You could, when you start printing for the new year, change the overprint rather simply to show uh, from say 14 to 15 and then 15 to 16. Okay, if it just says Royal Mail Dale, there, that's just from a, a standard uh, on this side, the right side. This, this one only applies to the one on the left. All the rest of these codes apply to the codes uh, to the right here. Uh, if it just says Royal Mail there, that's from, it's not a mistake, that just means these are come from the standard sheets that are sold at, at counters. Now this one, if you can still see, it says uh, TI. Going down the list, 
you find out that this was from a booklet of 12. The TI stands for uh, a booklet of 12. So uh, again, a security device uh, uh, to make it harder for uh, forgers. And particularly if, there, if you can associate where this is coming from and find out that somebody is using uh, something that's from a custom uh, booklet and it wasn't for, didn't apply to that stamp, it's a forgery. So anyhow. I think, I think this is also a great way to sell more stamps to collectors who collect all varieties. Absolutely, absolutely. Covers, uh, everybody knows about covers. So these are uh, just standard machines on covers. Interesting, this one was torn from a, a, a booklet and uh, put on a cover. This one is interesting. The postmark says, remember to use the postcode. So what's missing on this one? The postcode. Uh, on uh, Also, uh, what makes this uh, interesting, but not a rarity, uh, our family name is misspelled. It's spelled here K O T A C H I C K. Uh, not that's not us, but it got delivered to us, and uh, my wife accepted it. It's hers. So, come on, next. Sometimes it works. I'm going to get out of the laser pin printer. I know what I'm going to do to escape. There we go. First day covers. Uh, we're all familiar with first day covers. This is an example of one. Uh, one of the very few first day covers I have. Uh, I was excited when they came out with uh, the new uh, high value stamps. So I did in, in, indulge and in, in buy that one but I, I, I'm not a, a first day cover collector. This one I just happened to pick up. This one is a, a, a lot more interesting, at least to me. These are post notes. Uh, this is what the Royal Mail calls them. Uh, here, I think we call them letter sheets. These are, you can see Royal Mail first class. These were uh, issued to help support or promote the dairy industry. Uh, these came in seven different uh, varieties and uh, they came in a packet of seven and with a different drawing on each one. Very interesting to me was that in addition to these post notes, it had a small recipe book. And in, in putting this presentation together, I came across this, opened up the recipe book and boy, there are some pretty good recipes in there. Uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to convince my wife, Kathy, to uh, uh, make some of them. Uh, some of them have, you know, four tablespoons of whiskey uh, going into one uh, piece of pastry. Now, that, to me, is a good piece of pastry. Letter sheets, uh, air letters. Uh, U.S. used to produce them. Here's a British one. Uh, what's interesting about this one is it's the only time I have seen um, Welsh and here, this is an interesting, if it's in English, French, uh, Welsh and Gaelic, uh, four different languages on there. And beautiful design. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of what these are. These are were produced by a group, an organization called the uh, uh, Society, Society of Antiquaries. Now, I didn't know if they were referring to the people in the organization or to what they were interested in. In any case, uh, this is comes from uh, the uh, Society of Antiquaries. Uh, this one is also interesting because of the interior. I just love this interior.
This is a, a torque, T-O-R-C. It's a form of metal collar, collar that were, uh, was worn uh, during a certain period. And these are brooches. And this is a gold coin uh, from uh, the late 15th century. And this, this one, which was on the front, is actually uh, a, a, what's called a herald's coat uh, or, uh, and was used, it's called a tabard, worn by a herald. Herald was, had the status of an ambassador and uh, would war, wear these to uh, meetings and negotiations, especially if they were uh, uh, negotiating uh, terms of peace or war. Uh, so it was a it was a uh, a, a coat worn by a, a type of ambassador. Okay, uh, as you know, or as most of you know, the uh, Great Britain is uh, has what are are really like four different countries. It's called the United Kingdom. The official name is the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Interestingly, when we talk about these stamps. We talk about Great Britain, which actually only includes England, uh, Scotland, and Wales. It do, Great Britain does not include Northern Ireland. It's only when you say the UK, the United Kingdom, that you're including Northern Ireland, which is part of the uh, country. The Machins produced regional issues or country issues. Uh, different uh, uh, references use different names for those, for those areas. Uh, there are no uh, countries issued for England itself. What you have are for what we call Great Britain, but actually includes Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. Here are the same stamps uh, for each from uh, the same issue, same period of time. Uh, you can see, for the most part, the colors are the same. There is a color variation in this, this 5P stamp. And this is a different color. It's a darker color, 7P, 7.5P. And uh, I do want to point out one thing. The feature on these, there are two things that are noteworthy. Is First of all, you notice that the, the uh, effigy of the queen is smaller, reduced in size, and shifted to the right. And then the, a nation, the national symbol is uh, put into the upper left corner. For Northern Ireland, that is the red hand of Ulster uh, on a shield with a crown above. Uh, for Scotland, that is a uh, what is known as a lion rampant. Uh, as uh, it's a, it, they're different. <clears throat> the an animal in different uh, positions or forms have different terms in heraldry. This is uh, a lion rampant. And then this is the Welsh griffin. A griffin, although here it looks like it might be a dragon, it's not. A griffin is a, uh, has the uh, head, I'm sorry, the tail and uh, uh, hind quarters of a lion. And then, but then the wings and in, the, in this is the stylized head of a uh, of an eagle, and a griff. That's uh, uh, and this is the a national symbol. And if you ever would to, were to attend a uh, a Welsh rugby rugby match, you would see a lot of griffins on display. So, if you're interested in pursuing this, some places to start: uh, the Scott Catalog. Uh, I mentioned the MH prefix on uh, to the numbers for the Machin issues with some uh, exceptions, as I noted. And these are in a separate section of the catalog uh, in Great Britain, but they come after Wales and Monmouthshire. And I believe that is a mistake on the part of Scots saying Wales and Monmouthshire. It's true that early on, uh, Wales was, uh, this goes back quite a ways, 1543, they issued 
the parliament passed the Wales Act of 1542, but they mistakenly omitted Monmouthshire when they listed the counties. However, operationally, Monmouthshire, which is in the southeast corner of Wales, uh, was was Welsh, and it was treated as being Welsh for uh, over uh, four centuries. Finally, in the Local Government Act of 1972, uh, they redefined Wales, and this time included Monmouthshire as an official part of Wales. So Scott is probably about a bit out of date and continuing to list Monmouthshire when they talk about Wales and Monmouthshire. It's no longer a separate entity. And to put this into perspective, Scott's only has about eight pages uh, for Machen's. Now, eight pages uh, just for one issue in Scott's is a lot. Uh, and these include the reg regional issues. But it, as I've said a few times, it doesn't uh, uh, include the phosphor varieties, uh, uh, but it does list the booklets, but not listing each design of the booklet or the number in each series. Stanley Gibbons, whoops. I'm sorry, I have pushed the wrong button somehow. Go bang right back. Okay. Uh, Stanley Gibbons, to put this all into perspective, I have a uh, great, the Stanley Gibbon issue for volume four, Queen Elizabeth II decimal definitive issues. This is not, does not include the pre-decimal issues. This is in two volumes. Mine, I have the 2008 edition and uh, volume one, which is half of this uh, the coverage is over 600 pages long, just on uh, the uh, QE2 uh, definitives. It does include everything, phosphor varieties, plate flaws, booklets, uh, on and on and on. When I was doing research, one of the best websites that I came across, and this is a place that I, I highly recommend, is called uh, Great Britain Machins by the Machin Nut. nut. And uh, if you were to go online and I think look for the Machin Nut, you'd probably get to that site quickly. It's, 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 it's listed as adamware.ca Canada. It's a Canadian site. And uh, uh, it is excellent. I extracted those colors uh, from that page and uh, uh, it has, an immense amount of detail and what's well designed. You click on, for example, one of the colors of the on that chart that I had, and it'll take you right to that stamp and provide you the information about that stamp. An excellent resource. Well, now that we're halfway through my presentation, uh, I will now continue with uh, part two. Uh, I thought it would be nice to also cover the nations of other countries. And here we have Hong Kong. Oh. Oops, my wife Kathy just has come into the room and said, Bob, I think you should really wrap it up now. Well, in, in, and, and she Bob, is here. Bob, one of the things we need to, you know, we do usually is take a break. We could do that for a few minutes and come back, finish this up. No, 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 no. I, okay. I, I, I really want to finish this. All Hold right. You. Just a second. Uh, So, oh. I want to introduce you now to the world of nations. You have gone through the introductions. You're now here in the world of nations.
Thank you. <laughs> Very well done. Excellent. <laughs> so, Bob, I have a question. I have a question. Once I uh, ordered some stamp from Great Britain, and they sent them to me, and it had a label that had a form of that that had a machine on it, and the value, the denomination had been printed at the point of sale. Have you ever seen anything like that? Yes, I, I've seen those. Uh, yeah, they, uh, there, uh, a number of post offices are set up and they can just print uh, off stamps with different denominations and uh, for whatever the cost of the package. We, uh, our post office does that as well, but it's just uh, a, a label with what, the, the value and the, uh, uh, I guess the data, uh, it was printed, it doesn't have any real design on it. But the, the British ones do have a design. And if I remember correctly, uh, do they have a white background with gold on them? For, for, yeah. a, a very nice design. Are they horizon labels? I'm sorry. I think the horizon labels. I don't know what a horizon label is. I think that's what you're uh, Samil is is describing. The kind of the, the, po the posted the vet postage vended label that goes on with gold. I think they're called horizon labels. The one that I saw didn't. I don't remember that it had gold. It had just a, a mage I think in gray. Okay, and then it had a value. Yeah, I've got. Yeah, I, I've received those. First ones that were issued were white with a gray machin head. Okay. And they changed it to a gold background. Okay. And this... they're, they're now discontinued. Mm -hmm. They're discontinued? Well, what Mike is showing, they've changed it quite a bit. Oh. It's, okay. Machin head is now much smaller. But yeah. But these are individually printed at, I believe, at post offices, just like we have, do them here, except uh, theirs have the, 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 the beautiful design on them, but ours just have very simple. That's right. But you'd also yeah. find that if you bought one from a post office in Wales, it would be bilingual. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is an international tracking label with a major head on it. <laughs> so... Whole new field. Well, I, uh, one time at the uh, on uh, the uh, a visit to Windsor Castle, uh, I had to use one of the restrooms there. Uh, there are no public restrooms inside the castle, but they are uh, on the grounds, and I used it on on the. Uh, I noticed on the toilet paper in in the cubicle. Each sheet had printed on it uh, uh, property of uh, her, her HM uh, on it, I guess, Her Majesty. Uh, so they, they do use, uh, uh, the, the screen is, is, is everywhere. <laughs> but I feel they don't put the picture of the queen on the toilet paper. No, they did not. No. <laughs> Actually, uh, when uh, the Penny Black, and, and Mike uh, knows a lot more about this than I do, but I believe there was a, a, a lot of uh, controversy or controversy, depending on which side of the ocean you're on, about uh, which, uh, whether or not the Queen's head should be on the stamp and then be postmarked uh, and, uh, you know, obliterating part of her image. Yeah. A, a lot of people were offended by that treatment of the queen. That was an issue at the time. Other questions, folks? Bob, I have one. Uh, if you could, if you were in charge, would you come up with a different system of classifying the machins or would you leave it alone? In, in Scott, uh, yeah. Yes, uh, I, I don't know enough about, uh, I'd have to uh, do more with the Stanley Gibbons. I, I, I don't know, uh, but uh, uh, I, certainly something within Scott's, it, it may not be actually redo, redefining catalog numbers, 
but a guide how to navigate through uh, them. Uh, for example, uh, on the U.S. Specialized Catalog, they have uh, some a page, you know, for different issues to help you navigate to find uh, the catalog number for that combination of watermark perforations and so on. Uh, an equivalent thing uh, in terms of uh, color and uh, type of perforation, normal perforation versus syncopated uh, or die cuts, because you, you'll find in you, the same value stamp uh, in multiple, with multiple uh, numbers, <clears throat> catalog numbers in Scots, uh, and you have to find the one that matches the variety you have. And it, 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 it's not always easy to do. Okay, thank you. As a, by the way, you, from the regional stamps, there are now stamps for England. Oh, really? Regional stamps for England? Yes. Is that in preparation for the disunification of the United Kingdom? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think so. It, it really originated because the English were feeling put upon that the Scots, the Welsh, and the Irish had their own stamps. Why shouldn't the English? Well, that, that, that is a reversal of roles compared to what the Welsh, the Scots, and the Northern Irish feel about the English. Well, you can add uh, Cornwall to the list. I think they want to be their own country, too. Uh, it's, it's a land of pirates there. <laughs> yes. well, I think at least one of my English friends kind of supports the idea there should be an English parliament as well. He says that the English are getting tired of the fact that the, the Scots and the Welsh and the Irish have their own parliaments, but the parliament of the UK that governs England has Scots and Welsh and Irish members. So why should they be allowed to govern England when the English can't govern the other countries? Well, my, my personal view is that Brexit uh, is gonna have a lot of implications for how the United Kingdom evolves over the next several years. Um, that's my own opinion. I mean, uh, the Scots, the Scottish are uh, very upset about uh, uh, the losing of the uh, EU farm subsidies and uh, uh, the Northern Irish, there, there's already issues with Northern Ireland and the relationship with Ireland, uh, the Republic of Ireland and uh, I don't know. As long as well, the, the Welsh rugby team can keep pretty beating the, the uh, English on a regular basis, I think Wales may be able to hang on longer. <laughs> but which one is going to take their clothes off and paint their bodies blue or red and come over Hadrian's wall screaming? That's the question. Well, Scott. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Other questions for Bob? I have uh, my interjection here, real quickly. Um, this is the uh, front page of the complete digum. I assume you're seeing it. Yes, yes. Um, known as the Machen Encyclopedia. It lists 8,500 different Machens, not 2,000. Um, the other thing I was going to mention, you, you mentioned the... Um, Three and a half cent. Um, there are about 25 varieties of the three and a half cent, and these are all mapped out for you in the um, in this thing. You can actually print out pages. Uh, there, there's, I think there's 25 to 30 different three and a half P's, not including the uh, other denominations. Yeah. Um, Bob, is this just for, uh, just for the tagging alone? That's all this address is largely? This for all the perfs, all the tagging. Okay, okay. All the different printers, all the different styles of printing, mm -hmm. whole thing. Up to what year? Uh, mine's up to 2005, but there's a brand new one out. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I don't know. Very good. 
I, I don't know if that is going to uh, 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 make my wife feel more excited or if she's going to feel more overwhelmed. Yes, yeah, she's saying, <laughs> yeah, I think she was maybe, maybe she could get her head around 2,500 different varieties, but now with 8,500, uh, that, that's daunting. Is, are you seeing this screen now with the purple? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. This is page one of the three and a halfs. And that's page two. So there are a lot more varieties than what you're talking about. He has his own system of notating. Uh, he, as he's, as you said, the Scots are totally lacking and Gibbons, although they have their own ideas, they're certainly missing a lot, so. Yeah, but some, some of those varieties look like they're, uh, where the, the phosphor has bled to, or shifted and. No. No? All the phosphors are exactly as they're here. There are different other things that are different about them. There are different levels of collecting these as well. Uh, this is the absolute most detailed level that would drive you nuts. Yeah. There another level that's above that, which is probably very similar to um, what, um, what's his name? Uh, not Scott. Uh, Gibbons. Gib what Gibbons does uh, for his. Uh, but they, even in this particular, uh, even in this particular thing, they have in there um, introductions, colors, printing processes. You have different, there's a different booklet panes, miniature sheets. Um, it's it's a very uh, detailed process that this person goes through. Right. And they they also um, suggest levels of collecting anywhere from uh, the Scott way, which is one of each, or go to the the Gibbons way or to go a little bit further than that and maybe collect some of the other things. So um, it's, it's quite, um, this is quite a category. Quite, it's kind yeah. of amazing. Um, people have gone crazy. And you had, you had another somebody that went through this also. Um, this guy is not alone. Yeah, it's. Uh, I I I don't think there's any more complex issue of stamps in the world, I, or anything that even comes close to the complexity of this one. No, it does not. It is tremendously complex. I will yeah. say though that the the luminescence thing, you don't need a meter. You don't need a special thing no. to see it. That's nice. Yeah, yeah, and the the how clearly you see it varies on the color of the stamp. Right. Uh, some of them, it just pops right out at you. On others, you may have to tilt it a little bit so that the light catches the iridescence at an angle, and then you can see it clearly. Uh, I, when it, it first arrived, uh, that last uh, packet I showed of the most recent ones issued this, earlier this year, uh, I thought some of them had the iridescence and others didn't. But then when I just tilted it the slightest bit, I could see that they were all iridescent. It's just that some colors it shows up more easily and on others it doesn't. Okay. Very interesting. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Well, Bob, I gave up on Queen Elizabeth collecting about 15 years ago. And the reason why is I've got a 2015 concise catalog for Gibbons and Victoria to George VI is 61 pages and the whole book is 450 
and that's up to 2015. So basically almost 400 pages of Queen Elizabeth, which compared to the previous reigns <laughs> being 60 pages. Yeah. I thought, no, I'm not continuing. They're just issuing far too many. My, my wife, Kathy, would like to just focus on, was it Edward the Seventh? Edward the Eighth. Edward the Eighth. Eight. All, all six of them. All six. <laughs> There's four, well, four stamp, four actual stamps with a few variations. <laughs> Get them on cover. But, you know, looking at that yeah. uh, book from Bob, you know, with the, the permutations and combinations, it reminds me of this food that you like to eat and then you put on too much hot sauce. That would take the joy for me. I'd look at like Bob Kay's wife. I'd look at that thing and I'd go, oh, my God, just close it up. Kind of what you said, Mike, you know, when you saw those extra 400 pages, it's just too much. That's that's why That's I queen started. Earth. I started collecting them, and I finally stopped. Did you really? It was. It was to put it mildly. It's daunting. Yeah. <laughs> it's daunting. Well, Bob, I I've bought a number of collections, mainly for the previous reigns, and there's quite a few mentions in what I've got. I'm willing to bundle them up and send them to you. I, I'll take them, and I. Uh... <clears throat> Uh, I, I, I just got uh, your uh, postal address from Paul, and I have something I'm mail, mailing to you, and I am still looking for the okay. cover that we talked about. I, in all of this I've been doing, I've still not come across no, the penny it'll, block. You'll, you'll find it one day. One of these, well, you have are more optimistic than my wife, Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> what is it you're so, looking for? Yeah. On, a, on, a, on a British note, um, I saw an article today. We have the uh, clocks changing, or rather, I think they did in England last weekend. The, in Windsor Castle and the Estate, they have a gentleman called the Royal Horologist, and he has the task of changing 400 clocks twice a year when we change the, change the but some of those have right. to be wound daily. Yes. Oh, yes. That's yeah, why that's you have... right. he's got full. Em he's got full employment. Yes. <laughs> Good. Other questions for Bob? Okay. Excellent. Thank job. you. Thank you, Bob. Excellent Very job, Bob. Appreciate that. Very thorough. Yep. And then uh, send Charlie the the politically correct version then. You know, when you have it, and yep. then uh, that will go on to the, um, the website. And uh, Suzanne usually tapes these, so I'll send out kind of the verbal transcript, you know, as uh, as I receive it, I'll send out it to club members. 